Hello students and welcome back to lecture four of our Biology 100 series. Today we're going to discuss the structure of cells. So I mentioned earlier in the course that technically the smallest thing that a biologist would ever study would be a cell. So that means that this is the first lecture of the series where we're actually talking about biology. The, I realized the last two lectures were a little bit different because they were about chemistry and biochemistry respectively. Uh, but now we're going to start real biology and discuss cells. So what I'm going to discuss in this lecture is I will start by discussing what are all the things that you find inside cells. And uh, you know that, that uh, the human body has, if you look inside the human body, you find various organs like heart, liver, uh, intestines, stomach, and so on. And, and those, those are called organs. And if you look inside a cell, you will find microscopic organs as well. And those microscopic organs we call organelles, organelles. And so they are not made of tissues the way, you know, in the human body, each organ is made of a number of tissues and each tissue is made of billions of cells. Each type of tissue is made of billions of cells. So technically what you find inside a cell cannot be an organ because it's not made of even one cell. It's, it's actually smaller than a single cell. But organelles tend to be made of either phospholipids, uh, lipids or proteins or mixtures of any of those things. Uh, and so they are small, little tiny machines uh, that the cell uses to do various specialized activities that occur inside the cell. And then after we're finished learning about all the important organelles, we're not going to, I'm not going to force you to learn all of them because that's a, that's a subject for biology 200. Uh, we have a cell biology course. Like all the other universities in, in BC, we have a cell biology course called Biology 200, which spends an entire semester talking about what happens inside a cell. So in this course, we're only going to we're only going to touch briefly on what on the things that uh, the various more important of the cell organelles and their more important functions. And when we're finished with that, we're going to have a brief discussion about uh, different types of microscopes. And what are the what are the various uses of different types of microscopes that we use to look at cells and things even smaller than cells? OK, so again, I usually give you an overview of what I'm about to talk about. So we'll start out by talking about the difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. A spoiler alert, the main difference between a eukaryotic cell and a, and a prokaryotic cell is that a prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus. Uh, eukaryotic cells also tend to be about a thousand times bigger than prokaryotic cells. And furthermore, um, prokaryotic cells, uh, ma mainly we're talking about various forms of bacteria. Various forms of bacteria are prokaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells evolved, we believe, because we're the, the, the theory of evolution is only a theory of evolution, and we can't really say for certain because we were not there to watch. We were not there to watch these things evolve. But the, the current state of scientific knowledge says that eukaryotic cells evolved after prokaryotes and that prokaryotes preceded eukaryotes by about a billion years, by about a billion years. So, so for about a billion years on Earth, we had nothing but various types of bacteria living in the ocean. And then after about a, about a billion years after the first bacteria appeared, about a billion years later, we started to see the first uh, eukaryotic cells appear in, again in the ocean. There was nothing on land. Um, and then eventually plants evolved from uh, plants and other simpler animals, multicellular organisms basically evolved from uh, combinations of eukaryotic cells. And then, then we had the evolution of animals, fish, and, and things like that in the ocean, and plants in the ocean. Eventually, the ocean uh, plants in the ocean began to grow on land in tidal zones, in areas where they had enough moisture to do so. And eventually, plants uh, uh, made it onto land, and then some animals made it onto land. Uh, there was about a, there, there was a, uh, something like 300 million years. I don't, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but there was something like 300 million years where there was nothing, nothing but uh, uh, moss bryophytes on land on Earth. So 300 million years, you think human beings, modern human beings, 
what we call modern man, what the anthropologists call modern man, um, where men st you know evolved from primitive, more primitive animals. Modern man is what what we are today. That's we class we are classified as modern man. Only evolved, according to the people who study this, they believe that modern man only evolved sometime between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago. So that's that's no time at all in terms of evolution. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to imagine that for something like 300 million years or something like that, there was nothing but moss on the on the surface of on the dry surfaces of the earth on the land of the earth, which means that the, the earth the earth was a very boring place until about uh, 300 million years ago and modern man which is us we believe did not appear until about 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago and of that one or 200,000 years we have only been civilized for about 5,000 years a little bit longer than that maybe and so civilized man civilized human beings have only society as we know it or any anything similar to society as we know it has only existed for the last for the last five, 6,000 years. And if you think about what human beings have accomplished in that ridiculously short amount of time, it's pretty extraordinary. We've completely conquered the earth and, and, and subdued it to our own purposes. And now the only problem we have left is to subdue and, and control our own uh, base base instincts that are that are destroying things you know we have to we have to get rid of our bad habits uh, and or we may destroy ourselves we're no longer in danger of being eaten by animals or or, or, or destroyed by other other things in nature beyond ourselves we are now our, our only enemy that we have to worry about and what's what exactly is going to happen with that well your guess is as good as mine you can watch you can watch things happening but uh, uh, so that's a brief history of the world. Uh, that was a bit of a digression on my part, but I just wanted to tell you that the Earth, uh, there has been life on Earth for about four billion years. Human beings are a very recent development, and for about a billion of those four billion years, four, four billion years, there was nothing but bacteria, prokaryotes, and they lived in the ocean. And then, uh, starting a billion years later, we had eukaryotes, and eukaryotes basically. Uh, it, there are some cases where eukaryotic cells consumed prokaryotic cells. They ate them all the time, but they there is there are some notable examples where prokaryotic cells got inside eukaryotic cells, uh, and instead of being digested by the eukaryotic cells, they were kept as kind of slaves by the eukaryotic cells uh, because they provided things that the eukaryotic cell needs. Right, so that so in biology we call that a symbiotic relationship. A symbiotic relationship is where two organisms live in very close proximity. One organism actually may live inside the other organism, and they both benefit from this relationship. This this close living arrangement is is of an advantage to both of them. We call that a symbiotic relationship. So I will explain a little bit later what I mean by that, but basically. There, at some time, probably, uh, probably a couple of billion years ago, uh, some prokaryotic bacteria got inside eukaryotes, and the eukaryotes did not destroy or dissolve or digest those bacteria. They, the bacteria just stayed, and they actually produce a lot of the excess, a lot of excess energy. And that energy is actually used by the, by the host cell, the cell that the bacteria live inside. And so uh, it, the, the, the journey, the, the, the evolution of more complicated organisms, more complicated multicellular eukaryotes would not have been possible if not for the fact that some bacteria a few billion years ago, bacteria, prokaryotic cells got inside eukaryotic cells and started providing them with things, interesting things that they, they can use. All right, so then we will discuss the various cell organelles so I said that organelles are little microscopic organs. We will have a very brief discussion on the difference between animal cells and plant cells. We will give you a relative, a relative comparison of the size of bacteria versus animal cells versus plant cells. And that, of course, is relevant to a discussion of which types of microscopes we would use to look at cells. And that's critical because some, some microscopes are cheap but can only see cells that are relatively big. Uh, 
as opposed to other microscopes that are very expensive and can, and have great power of magnification and can see cells that are very are cells and cell organelles that are very very small. Uh, if you go into the biology lab in Columbia College, unfortunately, when I when at the time of recording this this lecture, we were still on COVID restrictions, so we don't have any biology labs in the building. But if you get back into the building and take a biology lab, you will use microscopes, and the little microscopes that we use in the lab are cheap. They're I mean they're not cheap by by regular standards. They're about a thousand dollars each, but that is cheap by biological equipment standards and those light microscopes can only see the largest cells basically and they, they are incapable of seeing they magnify a maximum of about 1000 times right so we measure the power of a microscope in in the power of magnification how many times bigger if you're looking at an image through a microscope how many times bigger can that microscope make the image than it actually is that's called the magnification power of a microscope light microscopes like we have in the biology lab for first year biology students to use only have a maximum magnification power of about 1000 times uh, very expensive electron microscopes cost about two hundred thousand dollars so they're they're uh, they're they're a hundred times or two hundred times more expensive than than the regular microscopes we use in the first year biology lab, but they are capable of uh, of magnifying things a million times up to a million times, which means that they can they can see not only cells but they can see all kinds of little things that reside within cells and that's part of how we know about what what is inside a cell by using very powerful microscopes like electron microscopes and if you take biology two hundred you will learn all about electron microscopes versus light microscopes versus a lot of other types of microscopes. All right, so let's talk about cells, the smallest unit of life. Now, a brief overview of the of the of the major organelles that I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, so we learned during our discussion of macromolecules that cells are surrounded by an outer layer. The outer layer is referred to as the plasma membrane. Right now, don't confuse the plasma membrane with something that we're going to talk about later called the nuclear membrane. Uh, by the way, one of the unfortunate things about science of uh, biology versus physics is that physicists talk about the nuclei and the nucleus, and they're talking about when they talk about it, they're talking about the nucleus of an atom. Uh, same thing for chemists. If they talk about the nucleus, they're talking about the nucleus of an atom. When biologists talk about the nucleus, they're talking about the round compartment inside a cell where the DNA is stored. Right? So the, the cell itself, the larger cell, has a, ha, is surrounded by a membrane called the plasma membrane, which is made of a phospholipid bilayer. And we discussed phospholipids last time and how they combine to form a phospholipid bilayer. And then if you go inside the cell, you'll find the nucleus. That's where the genes are stored. And the nucleus has another membrane, which we call the nuclear membrane. So do not confuse the nuclear membrane with the plasma membrane because they are two different membranes. The nuclear membrane surrounds the nucleus, of course, and the plasma membrane surrounds the outer part of the cell. Okay, now within the nucleus, by the way, you will find chromosomes. And in fact, in humans, you will find 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? So there are 20 humans. The if you uh, just some terminology for you. Uh, a genome, I'm sure you've heard the term genome, the, a genome is all the genes that a particular organism is supposed to have. The human genome, for example, consists of about, 20, about 23,000 genes, 23,000 different genes. And then, so the human genome is different than the tiger genome, and, and the tiger genome is different than the worm genome, and the worm genome is different than the bird genome, and so forth. But so every organism has a unique genome. So the human genome is composed of uh, 23,000 different genes. Right? Now, there are more than 23,000 different proteins in, uh, in typical human cells, and the reason for that is because genes can be sort of rearranged. This is beyond the scope of this course, but genes can be rearranged so that you can end up uh, translating multiple different proteins from the same gene. It's called an alternate splicing mechanism where you, you basically cut and paste bits and pieces out of the gene that you like and put them together in a different order. And then you can, you can create two or more different proteins from the same gene. Okay, so there are 23,000, approximately 23,000 genes in the human genome. 
there are a lot more than 23,000 different proteins that the human genome codes for, and that's due to this, this phenomenon called alternative splicing, uh, cutting and pasting different gene parts together. Okay, so genes, now the, the human genome consists of 23,000 genes. There are some organisms in the world where those genes, however many genes there are in the genome, uh, for example, you might have heard of uh, E. coli. You know that E. coli is a bacteria, bacterium. Uh, singular is bacterium, uh, plural is bacteria, right? So E. coli is a bacterium, and it, ha it, has, it has about 10,000 genes in its genome. And those 10,000 genes are all contained on the same single piece of DNA. And that piece of DNA is not very long. In fact, it's circular. The one end is actually joined to the other end. So we say that E. coli has a circular, has a circular, a single circular chromosome. Right. Now, if you go to more complicated animals, more complicated organisms, they often have their genome broken apart into two or more DNA fragments. Right. In fact, the human genome, if you had, a, if you had all 20, 23,000 genes on the same long piece of DNA, it would be very, very, very long. Uh, it actually is hard for the cell to manipulate and move, move genes around and do whatever it has to do with the genes if they're all contained on the same piece. It actually is much more convenient to have the human genome contained on multiple pieces of DNA. Right. So, in fact, the human genome, the 23,000 genes, are contained on approximately 23 pieces, well, exactly 23 pieces of uh, 23 different fragments. Right. And each of those pieces of DNA is called a chromosome. Each one is called a chromosome. Right. Now, so that means that we have 23 individual chromosomes that, can, that together combined contain the entire 23,000 genes of the human genome. Right. Now, that's kind of convenient because that means that there are approximately 1,000 genes per chromosome, right? And then we number the chromosomes. We number them chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 20, 21, 22, and then we have another chromosome that we call the sex chromosome, which determines, has, has a few genes on it, but it also, its main purpose is to determine whether you're male or female, and we'll talk in more detail about that later. All right, so we have... 23,000 genes in the human genome. Those 23,000 genes are distributed amongst 23 individual chromosomes. Each chromosome is a single thread, a single double helix of DNA, which is actually quite long. There's a lot of space that's wasted in between the genes on individual chromosomes. So if you, if you took all the genes that actually code for proteins out of the chromosomes and put them all together, they would probably take up the space of about one chromosome. But there's a lot of other intervening sequences of DNA in between those genes, and we're not quite sure what they're doing there, but, but they're there, and they take up a lot of extra space. In the old days, we used to call that junk DNA, as if it was garbage that had no function. Now we're, we're beginning to believe that it, has, it does, actually does a lot of things. So it, it does not, the junk DNA, as it's called, does not uh, encode proteins, but it does have many other functions, uh, which is beyond, again, beyond the scope of this course. You might discuss it in Biology 234, Genetics, and in Biology 200. All right, so we have 23,000 genes that constitute the human genome distributed across 23 chromosomes, and we have two of each of those chromosomes. So we have two of chromosome number one, we have two of chromosome number two, chromosome number three and so forth. All right, so that so because humans have, you don't need to know this for this course, but because humans have two copies of the human genome in every cell, we are said to be diploid, diploid organisms. And if you, if you take biology 234, you'll hear, you'll, you will hear that term a lot, diploid versus haploid uh, organisms that have only one copy of their genome are called haploid organisms. Uh, humans are diploid because every cell in the human body has two copies of every chromosome. And collectively, that means that every cell has two copies of the complete human genome. So you have two copies of every gene in every cell, right? You have two copies of every gene in every cell. And uh, those chromosomes are contained within the nucleus. And the nucleus is a very 
a complicated structure. It's kind of like a library because it contains all this genetic information. And they have librarians that are going around making copies of from various books and then sending the copies out to the outside of the outer regions of the cell. And then the, the workers, the ribosomes, will build those uh, copies, those messenger RNA copies into proteins. Uh, so anyway, well, the, that, so all of that takes place in the nucleus. Okay, what is the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote? As I said, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus and they're much smaller. Um, they they uh, preceded eukaryotes in evolution. They, they were around for about a billion years before eukaryotes uh, evolved. And they have no nucleus. That is their main, that's the main difference. Other than the fact that prokaryotes are much smaller than eukaryotes, they have no nucleus. And they have, they are generally haploid, meaning they have only one copy of their genome. The genome is quite small, maybe five or 10,000 genes in total. And, and it is contained on a single chromosome. And that single chromosome is not a single thread, it's a circle. Right? So the one end of the thread of DNA is attached to the other, so it's actually a circular chromosome. Uh, human, human chromosomes and the chromosomes of most other life forms on Earth are not circular. They are what we call linear chromosomes. Right? So make sure you, uh, not necessarily for this course, but make sure for other courses that you know the difference between linear and circular chromosomes. With a linear chromosome, it's a DNA double helix that's a long piece of DNA. With a circular chromosome, one end of the DNA is fused to the other end, so it makes a circle. Uh, only bacteria, as far as I'm aware, uh, only bacteria have circular chromosomes. And uh, um, basically, th there are theories about why the most primitive organisms, the bacteria, and the, actually the most primitive bacteria are called RK bacteria. Uh, and then we developed regular bacteria and then eukaryotes. Um, there are various theories about why bacteria have uh, circular chromosomes and more advanced organisms with larger genomes do not. And the theory is that, that as the organisms became more complicated, more genes were added to the genome. So the genome got bigger and bigger and bigger, and therefore the circle got bigger and bigger. The, the circular chromosome circle just kept getting bigger and bigger until it broke. It literally broke into dozens of pieces. And then that's what we have now. All right, so eukaryotes are larger. They have a, a nucleus. They have linear chromosomes, linear chromosomes. Uh, and they also, it's not on the list here, but they also have something called an endomembrane system. So from the first lecture, do you remember what the word endo means? It means inside, to go inside. Membrane, you know what that is. And so if you look at a bacterial cell, the only plasma membrane that you will see is the outer layer. Right? If you look at a eukaryotic cell, there are plasma phospholipid bilayers inside the cell as well. Obviously, the most, the most obvious example is the nucleus, which has a whole membrane of its own. And then there are two other endomembrane systems, which we'll talk about in a minute. One of them is called the endoplasmic reticulum, and the endoplasmic reticulum is divided into two parts called the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. That is an example of the endomembrane system. And another one are called the mitochondria, which have their member, uh, their own membrane as well. So there are, you will find some membranes inside a eukaryotic cell, in addition to just the outer surface, and that's why we say that eukaryotes have an endomembrane system. Okay, these are. Human cells, these are actually buccal cells that, that are found on the in, inner surface of your cheek. If you were taking the first year biology lab, one of the things you would get to do is you would take a toothpick and you would rub it on the inside of your cheek and then smear it on a microscope slide and then you would look at your own buccal cells under the microscope. Uh, we use buccal cells because they're easy to dislodge. When they take a DNA sample of somebody, they use the buccal cells because they're easy to dislodge and they contain a nucleus that has uh, DNA in it. So, so that's what that's another place where you would hear of buccal cells. Right. So, if any of you went into police work and you're interested in taking DNA samples from crime suspects, uh, what you would do is you would take a swab and you would rub the inside of their cheek and then put it into a bottle, a little little tiny test tube, and then they would do. Uh, 
something called the polymerase chain reaction to, to measure somebody's genetic footprint. Somebody's DNA fingerprint is what it's called. D DNA fingerprint suspects for crimes. And the reason why you use the buckle cells is because they're very easy to obtain and they're painless. In the old days, the police, when they wanted to take a DNA sample, they used to take a blood sample. And in fact, the blood has very little DNA in it to use, whereas the buccal cells have lots because they still have their nucleus, right? So here's the nucleus of these two buccal cells. These little things here are bacteria, right? So you can see the size difference. Bacteria are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. All right, so these are, on the left, we have a photo of eukaryotic cells. On the right, we have a diagram, which we're going to refer to as we go through this. This is a typical bacterial cell, by the way. So it has a plasma membrane on the outside and it has a, circ a single large circular chromosome on the inside. And I said it was a circle that doesn't look like a circle. And the reason why it doesn't look like a circle is because it is something it is said to be super coiled. You know what coiling is. That's when you twist something up. Well, just imagine you took a rubber band. Imagine taking a rubber band and putting it in your hand and then you rub your two hands together until that rubber band balls up into a little ball of rubber. It's still a circle, but it has been super coiled, right? So, so the bacteria typically have a single circular chromosome that exists inside the cell as a super coiled uh, circular chromosome. Okay, so we're not talking to scale here. Uh, obviously the bacteria should be much smaller than it appears in this diagram. All right, so let's talk about the scales of things. Okay, I mentioned earlier in the in the series that if you take a meter, a meter is the standard measurement of length according to the metric system. If you take a meter and you divide it by a million, you have something called a micrometer, right? A micrometer. If you do, if you take a meter and you divide it by a thousand, you have a milli millimeter. If you divide a meter by a million, you have a micrometer. If you divide a meter by a billion, 10 to the minus ninth, you have something called a nanometer, right? So a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. A micrometer is one one millionth of a meter. And the, the common way that cell biologists talk to each other about size is they say how many micro, micrometers or microns is that cell, right? So instead of using the word micrometer, which is very long, we abbreviate it and call it, we say micron. So a typical eukaryote typically is about 10 microns, about 10 microns in diameter. It has a nucleus. It has several linear chromosomes. In the case of humans, that number is 23. We have two of each, which means that we have two complete copies of the genome and therefore we are diploid. Prokaryotes typically are only about one micron in size. They have no nucleus. They have one singular circular chromosome, which is usually supercoiled, as you saw before. And because you have only one copy, uh, because a bacteria has only one copy of the genome, we say that it is haploid. Right? So those are some terms you should be familiar with, diploid versus haploid. I could ask you on a quiz, what is the difference between a diploid and a haploid organism? All right, let's look at the di different organelles that we would find inside a cell. All right, so the plasma membrane constitutes the boundary of the cell. It's the outer layer of a cell. We have the nucleus, which has its own plasma membrane that contains the DNA and the genes. We have some very small organelles that are called ribosomes. Ribosomes typically are only about five nanometers in size. Uh, so that is, if a cell is 10 micrometers in size, five nanometers is very, very small compared to the, to the total size. Right. So if Columbia College was a cell, five nanometers would be about the size of a library book or something like that, there would, or a, you know, a soccer ball or something. That would be the relative size of a ribosome relative to a cell. The jobs of ribosomes are to take, uh, within the nucleus, we make RNA copies of, of the genes, which are made out of DNA. So if we make a cheap, uh, fast, inexpensive copy of that DNA, we do it with RNA. Uh, the RNA is unstable and doesn't last very long, but we don't care because we're only going to be using a temporary, we're only going to be using this temporarily. So in the nucleus, 
We have librarians basically who make RNA copies from DNA genes. That is called a messenger RNA or an mRNA. You might have heard that. Uh, you might have heard that in the context of uh, vaccines just even even recently, right? So the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, so we'll talk about what that what that means later on in the course, but it means that instead of injecting you with dead viruses, for that, those two vaccines, they inject you with messenger RNA that codes for some of the proteins that the virus has. And instead of injecting your body with the proteins directly, like the AstraZeneca or the, or the other vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine does, they inject you with messenger RNA that simply encodes viral uh, COVID viral proteins. And uh, so that's, that's what messenger RNA is. Okay, so in the nucleus, we make cheap messenger RNA copies of the genes, which get sent out to the outer part of the cell. Uh, by the way, the outer part of the cell, the, we have the nucleus inside, and then we have the plasma membrane that defines the outside of the, of the cell. What do we call the area in between the nucleus and the plasma membrane? What do we call the area between the nucleus and the plasma membrane? membrane? It is called the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm, right? So you need to remember that word. It's actually on the list here, All right? So the area between the nucleus and the plasma membrane on the inside of the cell is called the cytoplasm. So that means that we make a copy of the DNA in the nucleus, a messenger RNA copy, and that messenger RNA is sent out to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are. Right, so that it's like the factory floor versus the office. The, 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 the plans to build the cars or whatever you're building are in the office. They, they're stored in filing cabinets. The filing cabinets are allegorically, the filing cabinets are the chromosomes. You find the gene on one of these chromosomes, you make a cheap photocopy of it. That would be a messenger RNA. You send somebody with the cheap photocopy out onto the factory floor where the ribosomes will put together the car that you have the plans for. Okay, so so those ribos most of many of the ribosomes are located in the cytoplasm, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the ribosomes are responsible for putting together the protein. That is a process called translation, right? Then now just outside of the nucleus, and actually it's attached to the nucleus, we have an endomembrane structure called the endoplasmic reticulum. The word reticulum means is a word for a bunch of folds. Okay, so we have this highly folded membrane called the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a network of membranes where proteins are synthesized, but specifically proteins that are meant to be exported out of the cell. Right, so that distinction is critical. So if a protein is meant to be built and then kept inside the cell, it is translated by ribosomes that are just floating around randomly in the cytoplasm. If a cell produces a protein that is meant to be exported out of the cell, it will produce it in the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum has a whole bunch of ribosomes that are stuck to the outside of it. And when those ribosomes are finished translating the protein that's meant to be exported, they put the protein into the endoplasmic reticulum. Right, so the endoplasmic reticulum is sort of the first step in the journey of exporting a protein. What would be an example of exporting a protein? Well, you know about insulin. And now, because I showed you a picture of it in the last lecture, you know that insulin is a, is a protein. Okay, so the cells that produce uh, protein uh, produce insulin are located in the pancreas, in the human pancreas. And, and uh, those are called... Uh, uh, islets, uh, cells that are present in structures called islets of Langerhans. Um, uh, they, those particular cells in the pancreas produce insulin and secrete it. Secrete means to export, right? So I'll, you'll hear me use the word secrete a lot in this course. When I say secrete, <laughs> unfortunately uh, in English, the word secrete has two meanings, right? So uh, one meaning is you, you wanna hide something, right? So if I say that, I saw a criminal suspect secrete a knife into the trunk of his car. That means that he's hiding it. I saw him hide something. But in, but in this case, we mean secrete means to send out, to, to export. Right, so for proteins that are meant to be secreted out of the cell, exported out of the cell, they are translated on ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and then they end up eventually being secreted outside the cell. Okay, now, 
we also have another endomembrane system called the Golgi complex. Golgi complex. The Golgi complex is always spelled with a capital G because it's named after a scientist who first discovered it. Discovered it. Golgi. And uh, uh, what the Golgi complex does. Now, here's something you, you need to know. Uh, some proteins. So you know what proteins are, and you know what carbohydrates are. Okay. Now, if you have there are some macromolecules where we attach, we deliberately attach carbohydrates to proteins. Right? So we take a protein and we stick a bunch of carbohydrates to it, specific carbohydrates. And when, when you stick carbohydrates onto a protein, that is called a glycoprotein. That is called a glycoprotein. Right. So in the future, I might ask you on a test what to explain what a glycoprotein is. And a glycoprotein is a protein that has specific carbohydrates that have been attached to it. And so it's a combination of a protein and a carbohydrate. Now, when you when you stick carbohydrates onto a protein, that is called glycosylation. Glycosylation is the process of sticking carbohydrates on specific carbohydrates onto a protein. And so something must glycosylate these proteins. So in fact, what happens is proteins that are meant for export are synthesized, they are translated in the endoplasmic reticulum. They then travel from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi complex. The Golgi complex glycosylates the protein and turns it into a glycoprotein and then exports it out of the cell. Those, gly those, glycolys uh, those carbohydrates that are attached to the protein are often used to help. So, so we're going to send this protein out into the environment, either out into the fluids of the body or in some cases out into the blood. Those prote proteins will travel through the blood or through another bodily fluid called the lymph. And eventually they will make contact with another cell and try to get inside. So when we're sending proteins out of one cell to travel through the body and get and and get taken into another cell the other cell is going to judge whether or not the protein is allowed to come inside based on what carbohydrates have been attached to the outer surface okay. and the golgi complex is responsible for for putting specific uh, carbohydrates onto the surfaces of specific proteins which then in a way they kind of act like addresses on parcels Right. So the Golgi complex is sometimes uh, compared to a post office because you bring your the, you know, you you are the endoplasmic reticulum. You bring your parcel to the post office and the post office. They say, where do you want to send this? And you say, I want to send it over here. And they they stick an address onto it and then they send it out and it ends up going to the post office where they intended it for to go. So that's basically what happens in the Golgi complex. Certain specific proteins uh, are, uh, certain specific carbohydrates are attached to certain specific proteins. And when those proteins are, are secreted out into the blood or out into the lymph or out into other fluids, they travel for a while and then they get taken up by other cells. They get internalized by other cells based on the carbohydrates that are attached. And studying how the Golgi complex does this and which pro which carbohydrates must be attached and how they get attached and what what is the shape of those carbohydrates and what is the specificity how do they confer specificity all of that is a very uh, huge area of research in in cell biology at the moment there are people who study people they're scientists who spend their entire lives studying just how the golgi complex does this all right now that's the golgi complex now mitochondria are symbiotic bacteria that entered eukaryotic cells a billion years ago. And the eukaryotic cells, instead of digesting them and eating them, noticed, quote unquote, noticed that those bacteria were producing a lot of surplus energy. And so instead of destroying them, the eukaryotic cells decided, quote unquote, to just keep them as energy producing slaves, which is kind of what they are. So we no longer, those, um, those bacteria that got into the eukaryotic cells um, are special, very special types of archaebacteria that don't exist anymore. Or they do exist, but, they're, but only close relatives of them still exist. Uh, and they tend to produce a lot of surplus energy. And uh, 
that so so mitochondria are sometimes called the energy factories or the powerhouses of the cell so so if if not for these symbiotic bacteria producing lots and lots and lots of energy for the cell to use we would never have been able to evolve into multicellular organisms because uh, if you don't have, th there are uh, single-celled eukaryotic organisms on Earth now called pr protists, and they do not have mitochondria. Many of them do not have mitochondria, and they're not terribly energetic. And so there's, there are, if you don't have energy, there are not a lot of things that you can do. If you can't do very many things, you're less likely to survive. So evolution depends on your ability to survive. If you have a lot of energy, you're more likely to survive than somebody who doesn't have much energy. And so that's just the way it, it turned out. So we are the descendants of eukaryotic cells that have a lot of extra energy. And that is, that is what is able to power our you know, our motors and our muscles and everything like our neurons and our brains and everything like that due to the fact that our cells tend to produce a lot of energy. And so lucky for us. All right, now the cell is not just a, a shapeless blob. It's not just an amorphous blob. It is actually held into a certain specific shape by a skeleton. So you know that the human body has a skeleton that's made of bones. Each individual type of cell, and there are several different types of cell in the human body. So, so one of the things that differentiates humans from simpler organisms is that we, we are multicellular organisms that have specialized cells. Right? So in a human, a brain cell is different than a liver cell, and a liver cell is different than a heart cell. And the reason for that is because out of the, out of the 23,000 genes that are in the human genome, a brain cell is, only, is using a subset of, 50, uh, of uh, 15,000. A heart cell is using a different subset of 10,000, a different 10,000, and so on. And that causes those cells to specialize to do different jobs. Right? So in humans, humans are multicellular organisms with what are called differentiated cells. The cells, differentiated cells means that they have adopted a specialty. They have, they have differentiated so that they're specialized, so that a heart cell does not do the same things that a kidney cell does, and a kidney cell does not do the same things that a brain cell does. These are all specialized cells. Right. So there are different types of cells that assume different functions. Those different types of specialized cells also have different shapes. They are held into those different shapes by the cytoskeleton. And so the cytoskeleton comes from the word skeleton and cytoplasm, right? So cyto, the word cyto means cell, honestly, to be honest, it means cell. So cytoskeleton literally translates as cell skeleton. And it's not made of bones, it's made of proteins. It's made of specialized proteins. Okay, now, in, there are many cases where you have cells that are stuck to each other in a multicellular organism. Like on, if you look at the outer surface of human skin, for instance, you see that the cells are very, they are, they are literally attached to each other, which is what makes our skin watertight. And, the, and our skin is watertight. That's actually part of its function is to, is to keep, not to keep water out, but to, but, uh, sorry, not to keep water from getting in, but the purpose of human skin is to keep water from getting out so that we do not dehydrate, right? So in order to do that, the cells of the skin have to be tightly held together quite tightly, and they are. So there are some cells that are attached directly to other cells, but there are many other examples of cells in the human body that are not directly attached to other cells. They are attached to kind of a sticky protein mess that kind of holds them in place, and we call that the we call that a matrix, right? So if you take uh, the term matrix always means you have a complicated thing and, and the matrix is kind of the scaffolding that everything is fixed into, right? The matrix. And in the case of a cell, the extracellular matrix, you can guess what extracellular means. So that means outside the cell. In certain places in the body, you have an extracellular matrix where you have cells that are embedded in a kind of a semi-solid substance, right? And so the extracellular matrix is located outside of cer certain types of cells. So cartilage, for instance, we'll, we'll talk about cartilage later, but cartilage is the kind of hard but flexible material that makes up your ears and so on uh, and, and your nose. Um, the cells that make cartilage are called chondrocytes. That's beyond the scope of this course, but but the cells that make the cartilage are called chondrocytes, and the chondrocytes are not close together. They're kind of far apart, and they are embedded in an extracellular matrix that we call cartilage. 
All right, so let's look at our map. So here we have the plasma membrane. Right? These green things are meant to be part of the cytoskeleton. So are these things. These little things that look like chili beans are meant to be mitochondria. This is meant to be the nucleus, of course. Right? This stuff here is the endoplasmic reticulum. So proteins that are meant to be secreted, exported from the cell are produced there. But notice that we have all these red things that are stuck to the outer surface. Those red things are meant to be mitochondria, uh, sorry, ribosomes. And notice that we have some ribosomes that are just kind of floating around at random inside the cytoplasm. And then over here we have the Golgi complex whose job it is to glycosylate proteins that are meant to be exported from the cell. So they kind of put a carbohydrate address onto proteins, glycoproteins, and send them out of the cell. Okay, so the plasma membrane we know from before is made of two layers of phospholipids. Now, they are, uh, if it was just made of two layers of phospholipids, it would be very flexible, probably too flexible and weak to be of any use to us. So, as I mentioned in the last lecture, the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, is reinforced with cholesterol, which is a, a derivative of a fatty acid. And so you have, the more cholesterol you put into the phospholipid bilayer, the stronger it becomes. The, the plasma membrane also has little holes in it. Sometimes those holes are, you, the cell has the ability to open and close those holes, and sometimes they're just open all the time. We call those membrane channels, and they let things go in and out. Uh, things are transported in or out. If, thing, if the hole is always open, <clears throat> if, or if you open the hole and things come, come in from outside simply because they're not very concentrated on the inside, relative to the outside. That is something called passive transport. Right? And on the other hand, if you take, if you open one of these holes and you start pumping something in, even though it's already very concentrated inside the cell, that takes a bit of energy. And so we call that active transport. All right, now on the surface of the cells, on the surface of the plasma membrane, we have things called receptors or cellular receptors. Okay, so I mentioned the fact that there are some cells like uh, the, like the like the pancreatic cells that produce insulin, that insulin is sent out of the cell and then it travels through the blood until it goes into other cells. It's received and then goes into other cells. The, the, the things on the outer surface of the cell that will receive the insulin are called receptors. Uh, and re there are many uh, different types of recep receptors on the surface of a typical cell, not just receptors for insulin, but receptors for a whole plethora a whole, uh, a whole plethora, a whole range of different proteins and other things that that want to make contact with the cell and sometimes go inside. Uh, now you know that human beings send signals to each other using radio waves or television waves or things like that, Wi-Fi. Well, cells communicate with each other as well all the time, except they don't use radio waves. They use things called cytokines and growth factors, which are proteins. And they also use other things called hormones to communicate with each other, All right? So cytokines, growth factors, and hormones are intercellular signals. The word inter means between, right? So Vancouver International Airport, inter, sends airplanes to different countries. If Vancouver, if Vancouver Airport only sent airplanes within the province, we would call that, or within Canada, we would call that an intranational airport. But it's it sends between countries, so it's international. Okay, so intercellular, intercellular means between cells. So intercellular signaling means sending signals from one cell to the other, except that we don't use radio waves or anything like that. We send proteins or hormones between cells in order to communicate. So we're going to learn all about that when we discuss the endocrine system, because the endocrine system deals with the, the tissues and the cells that make these intercellular signals. But for now, you should be aware that there are many different types of receptors on the surface of every cell that are used for communication and for import and export and so on. Okay, now the membrane is said, the plasma membrane is said to be selectively permeable because it lets water go through, it lets water go in and out freely, but not other things. Now that leads to, to, to a 
uh, that leads to a phenomenon called osmosis. Uh, osmosis means that uh, water will follow salt, right? So if you have a higher salt concentration inside of a cell than outside of a cell, let's say you have a cell that's floating in water, if the concentration of salt is higher inside the cell than outside the cell, water will go into the cell in order to try and equalize the concentration of salt on both sides of the membrane. Sometimes that will cause the cell to swell up. In fact, sometimes it will cause the cell to swell up so much that it will burst, and that's uh, that's called plasmolysis. But anyway, uh, so if you have cells that have salt, various concentrations of salt inside versus outside the cell, water will either go inside the cell or outside the cell, depending on which area has the highest concentration of salts. So if you put a uh, if you put a cell into a solution that has a low salt concentration, the odds are the water will go from the solution into the cell to try and equal, equalize the concentration of salt on both sides of the membrane. If the concentration of salt is greater in the solution than inside the cell, you tell me what will happen. Right, so the water in the cell will go out into the solution to try and in an attempt, often a vain, futile attempt, to equalize the concentration on both sides, and the cell will shrink. Right. Okay, so that happen we, we see examples of both of that happening in the human body, by the way. And so when you have cells that expand due to water coming inside, it causes swelling of the tissues. It causes swelling of the tissues. And later on in the course, you'll see that when you get swelling of the tissues due to water seeping in, water coming into the cell due to osmosis, when you have swelling of the tissues due to osmosis, we call, we call that edema, edema. Right? So that's why sometimes you have people who have poor blood circulation and their, their legs or their feet will swell up if they sit down too long or if they stand in one place too long without walking around, their feet or their legs will swell up, that's called edema and that is caused by literally caused by fluid leaking into the cells due to osmosis okay so the area finally the area inside of the cell is called the cytoplasm uh, actually we do not call it the cytoplasm inside the nucleus we have another name for that you can probably guess what it is the the area inside the nucleus is called the nucleoplasm so the cytoplasm refers specifically to the area between the plasma membrane and the nucleus all right, here's a diagram of the plasma membrane. You can see that it has it has receptors on the outer surface that are supposed to receive signals. It has uh, these things here. These things down here are meant to be cholesterol that's embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. We have a lot of proteins that are actually embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. We call those integral proteins. And we have some, some of these little tunnels here and their purpose, these are membrane channels to let things in and out. And sometimes that letting things in and out is requires energy, which we would call active transport. Sometimes it happens spontaneously, so we call that passive transport. Okay, so we have intracellular signaling. So here we have a cell that produces a glycoprotein and sends it out where it travels through the blood or through the lymph fluid and it gets received by a receptor on another cell. And then that receptor, that, that signal tells this cell to do something to produce more insulin or to or to uh, change shape or something like that so signal intracellular signaling happens between cells all the time okay so i said that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable to water which can freely cross in and out of the membrane right so that leads to something called osmosis that means that water can go in and out depending on the tonicity now you do need to know this word right tonicity is a fancy word for the concentration of the solution, the concentration of solutes in the solution. Okay, so tonicity. I will ask you about this word at some point. So if you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, the word tonic is derived from tonicity. Right? If you put the cell into a hypotonic solution, that means that the solution has a lower tonicity than the cell, than the inside of the cell. Okay, so you can you you would need to tell me whether water water will go in or out of that cell. But you can see from the slide here, I've already written the answer. If you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, water will go into the cell and it will swell up. 
if it swells up enough, it may actually burst. Right? On the other hand, if you put a cell into a hyper, right? So the word hypo means less than or below. The word hypo means less than or below. The word hyper means more than or above. So if you put a cell into a hypertonic solution, water will go out and the cell will shrink in the human body when that happens. Uh, particularly, it happens sometimes to red blood cells. We call that crenation. So if you look at human blood cells under the microscope, you can see whether there's too much salt or too too little salt in the human blood, because the, if, there, if there tends to be too much salt in the human blood, you'll see crenation of the, of the red blood cells. OK, the word iso means the same. Right, so hyper, hypo, and iso. Isotonic solution means that the concentration of salts and various other sol uh, solutes in the solution is the same both inside and outside of the cell. That means that there will be no net inflow or outflow of water. It means that, sh sure, water is going in all the time and water is coming out all the time, but not there is no net gain or loss. So the cell neither shrinks nor swells, right? So I. I could ask you on various quizzes about all this. Right? So make sure you're familiar with how, how a cell will behave in a hypotonic solution, a hypertonic solution, and an isotonic solution, and how these are all examples of osmosis. And osmosis is a characteristic that you get due to the selective permeability of the cell plasma membrane. All right, the word endocytosis is a fancy word meaning to bring things into the cell. So there's the word cyto again, which means cell. The word endo, which means going in. Okay, so endocytosis, and I could ask you about this on quizzes and so on. Endocytosis means the process of bringing things into a cell. By the way, what do you think the what do you think the word is for sending things out of the cell? Of course, that would be exocytosis. All right, there are three methods that a cell uses to bring things inside. One is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. You do, you do need to know what this is. It'll probably be on the midterm exam, guaranteed. Abbreviated RME, receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, we have receptors on the surface of the cell. When a specific protein called a ligand, a specific protein, a ligands are all is the generic term for cytokines and growth factors and hormone, different types of hormones. If a uh, ligand, uh, like let's say it's a protein, a cytokine, if a, if a cytokine attaches to its receptor on the cell, usually what happens is it was only meant to, it was only meant to signal the cell to do something. But there's a problem, which is that once the cell, once the, once the cytokine binds to its receptor on the surface, and the receptors are actually specific for the thing that binds to them. It's, it's, a, it's basically a lock and key mechanism where only a specific cytokine can bind to a specific receptor that was made to receive it. All right, so we put the key in the door and it, get, it sent the signal to the nucleus telling the cell to do something. Now we have to get these cytokines off of the receptors again so the cell can react a second time, right? So if you just stimulated the receptor once and it can never be stimulated again, that would be no good. So we have to find some way to remove the cytokine from the receptor. What usually happens is the receptors, once they've been stimulated and they've become attached to the cytokine, once the cytokine has been become attached to these receptors, they cluster together and then they get pulled into the cell where the cytokine is removed and then the cells get put back on the surface of the cell so they can, they're ready to be stimulated again. All right, so when you have that process of bringing the stimulated receptors into the cell, that is referred to as receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis. Right. Now I'm going to tell, uh, tell you a story in a minute about how the, the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis is used by some nasty viruses to trick the cell into bringing it inside. Right. So the HIV, of course, is the human immunodeficiency virus. The human Im immunodeficiency virus kills cells of the immune system by getting inside. Normally those cells wouldn't let it inside except that it, ha it, it has proteins on its surface that resemble cytokines that are meant to go into that cell, right? So viruses like the human immunodeficiency virus get inside their target cells using receptor-mediated endocytosis. It's basically, HIV is basically a letter bomb. 
right? So you 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 open your door. There's a parcel there with your address on it. You say this must be must be. I'll take must be for me. I'll take it inside. You take it inside and you open it and it explodes and kills you, right? So HIV is a letter bomb that gets inside using by exploiting the process of receptor mediated endocytosis. All right. There's another type of endocytosis called phagocytosis. The word phago is an ancient Greek word meaning to eat, right? So this is literally cell eating. What happens with cell eating is that the, the uh, plasma membrane will reach out and envelop a particle of food outside the cell and pull it inside and eat it, consume it, right? So that's a, that's a function of the plasma membrane. So the reason I'm talking about this right after we talked about the plasma membrane is because these three forms of endocytosis are all functions one of the one of the one of numerous functions of what the plasma membrane does okay so phagocytosis is where the plasma membrane kind of reaches out and engulfs a food particle and brings it inside to eat it and pinocytosis is where the cell membrane reaches out and engulfs a bunch of fluid and brings it inside so it's technically cell drinking so you do need to be familiar with the three forms of endocytosis receptor mediated endocytosis rme phagocytosis and and pinocytosis all right, this is a microscope image showing phagocytosis. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. That's not what this is. This is showing, uh, this is showing receptor-mediated endocytosis. So this diagram here shows the receptors on the surface. That's these little Y shapes. And then the cytokine that's meant to bind to those receptors are these purple triangles. So here you see receptors that have the cytokines on, attached. And once these receptors have been stimulated, they are brought inside, receptor-mediated endocytosis. And then the, the cytokine ligand is removed from the receptor, and then they are sent back out to the surface again. So they're put back out on the surface. And this is an amazing uh, microscope image from, from something called an electron microscope that's showing this happening in real time. Right, so here the receptors have been stimulated, and they're starting to get the, the plasma membrane is starting to pinch inward and form a, a, a what's called a vesicle. And then the receptors will be, uh, you know, the, the ligand, the cytokine will be stripped off the receptors once they're in, inside, and then the receptors will be put back on the surface. All right, here we have an example of the human immunodeficiency virus using proteins on its surface that the cell thinks are ligands that are meant to stick to the CD4 receptor, a specific receptor that you find on immune cells, on white blood cells called the CD4 receptor. The, the human immunodeficiency virus has proteins on its surface that are referred to as viral attachment proteins that mimic the ligand that is naturally supposed to attach to the CD4 receptor. So this is a, a way of getting inside the cell by tricking it. So the HIV virus gets into the cell uh, uh, by pretending to be a proper ligand. All right, so here we have phagocytosis, right? So the, the, the plasma membrane is kind of reaching out and engulfing a particle of food and taking it inside versus pinocytosis, grabbing some liquid, bringing it inside versus receptor mediated endocytosis, which is where the receptors are stimulated and then they bring in, they're brought inside. This is a macrophage. This is an image of a microscope image of a macrophage, which is a, a white blood cell of the human body whose job it is to eat dangerous bacteria that get inside your body. So why would a cell want to eat something? It doesn't, in most cases, cells inside the human body don't need, don't need to eat food to live. They get nutrients from the blood supply. So why on earth do we still have phagocytosis in the human body? Well, the reason is the, the main example of phagocytosis in the human body is white blood cells called uh, phagocytes. In this case, this is a cell called a macrophage. It has the word phage at the end, which means to eat and to eat and destroy. The word macro means large. So this literally translates as a, as a white blood cell that is a big eater. It's a big cell, and that's why it's called a macro. And it is a, it is a phagocyte, meaning that it's a cell whose job it is to eat things. And its job is to reach out. It's reaching out and spearing, kind of reaching out and grabbing like an octopus. 
reaching out and grabbing bacteria that have invaded and infected the human body. And it brings them, it pulls them back to the body like an octopus pulling things in with its arms. And then it puts these bacteria onto the outer surface and then the plasma membrane will reach out and engulf the bacteria and bring it inside and destroy it. So that's what mag macrophages do, a class of cells called phagocytes. And we're gonna talk about these extensively when we talk about the immune system. All right, let's move on to the nucleus. Okay, so it has its own plasma membrane called the nuclear membrane. It has chromosomes, genes on chromosomes. If the DNA genes are copied, we make a cheap copy called a messenger RNA, right? And we send that out into the cytoplasm for the, for the ribosomes to build proteins with. Okay, so the ribosomes will, when you make an RNA copy from a DNA template, that is called transcription. And then when you take that messenger RNA, you make a messenger, when you transcribe a gene, you make a messenger RNA. And then when that messenger RNA is, is converted into a protein by ribosomes, it is called, that is, that process is called translation. So the, the messenger RNA is translated into protein by ribosomes in the, either in the cytoplasm or ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. All right, so we saw where the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum are. Okay, now within the nucleus, we have these chromosomes. Uh, you've probably seen chromosomes that look like this, but in fact, they only look like that when the cell is in the process of dividing. When the cell is not dividing, when it's just sitting there, you know, doing its business, the, the chromosomes will actually unwind so that the, kind of like pulling the, a thread off of a long spool, it kind of unwinds so that all the genes are more easily available to be transcribed. All right, so this is a this is a microscope image showing an X chromosome on the on the upper left and a Y chromosome on the on the right side. You can see that the Y chromosome is much smaller than the X chromosome, and then you probably already know that if you have two X's, if you have two X chromosomes, you're female, and if you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, you're male. Okay, so you know that humans are divided into two sexes. Women generally have an X and, a, X and two X's, pardon me, and men have an X and a Y. That is not universally true, however. And I, I'll talk to you later on, if we have time in the course, I'll talk to you later on about some genetic, uh, genetic abnormalities where you can have a woman that has three X chromosomes and you can have a man that has an X and two, uh, sorry, two X's and a Y chromosome. That's something called Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, it is possible to have a woman that has only one X and no other paired chromosome. That's something called Turner's syndrome. Uh, we might have time to discuss those things depending on how the course goes. All right, so here we have a plant cell that is in the process of dividing. So as I said, when the cell is not dividing, when it's just sitting around doing its business, the chromosomes are not compressed. But when the cell has to divide, as you see here, it, it basically grabs the DNA and starts wrapping it around these, winding it up into these spool shapes, which are the chromosomes. And so the chromosomes are only visible when the cell is actually dividing. This is another type, a stronger type of microscope showing you the nucleus, right? So here we have a nucleus in the middle where the chromosomes are not uh, compressed. They're quite diffuse and you, so you can't see any individual chromosomes in here. Notice out here, all this stuff is endoplasmic reticulum, right? Uh, here, this is, the, this is the Golgi complex over here. Okay, so ribosomes are very small organelles that where messenger RNA is translated into protein. If the protein is meant to be used inside the cell, the ribosomes are located in the cytoplasm. If it's meant to be exported, the ribosomes are attached to the outer surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. This is kind of a, a rough diagram of what a ribosome looks like. So it's made of two different parts that join together when it's about to, uh, when it's about to be used. And then here you can see the messenger RNA is being threaded through the ribosome. And as the messenger RNA is being threaded through the ribosome, each individual codon is symbolizing a, an amino acid. So the amino acids are attached one after the other after the other in order to make the protein. 
So the endoplasmic reticulum is a net is a network of membranes. Now there are actually two different forms of the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum looks rough when you see it. It looks kind of bumpy on the outside, like it would be rough if you could rub your hand on it if you had a very small hand. And it's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it has ribosomes attached to the outside, which give it a outside of the surface, which give it a bumpy appearance. There's there are other parts of the endoplasmic reticulum that are called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. They do not have ribosomes attached and within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is where lipids are created. Lipids are put together in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Right? So I could, I could very well ask you this question on a test. I could ask you where, where are proteins that are intended for export synthesized? Where are, they trans, uh, where are they translated? And the answer is in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then I could ask where are lipids synthesized or built? The word synthesized means to make or to build. Where, where are lipids synthesized? And the answer is they are synthesized inside the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All right. Okay, so the rough endoplasmic reticulum, by the way, is attached to the nucleus. In fact, it's, a, it's basically a continuation of the nucleus that just, of the nucleus that just has a different function. So this is a, a diagram showing the nucleus. If we'd taken away what was inside the nucleus, and then you can see that it's continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. This is a microscope image of the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you look around here, you see it kind of look, has these dark spots attached to the outside of the folds. This is a diagram of what that looks like. So that's why it looks rough under the microscope. Okay, here again, you can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Golgi complex is a network of membranes where proteins are glycosylated in order to export them out of the cell. There's a diagram showing the Golgi complex and you can see here proteins being synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and then being sent to the Golgi complex. They travel through the Golgi complex where they have carbohydrates put on and then they are exported out of the cell via exocytosis. This is a microscope image of the actual Golgi complex in a cell. You can see the scale on this microscope image. It says this, this scale bar here represents 0 0.1 microns, meaning that this is about 0.1 micrometers. Mitochondria are energy factories in the cell. Now, what you don't know, what I haven't told you about so far, I, I mentioned the fact that glucose is the main energy source for the cell. Humans store glucose in the liver and in the muscles in the form of glycogen, in the form of glycogen. Uh, and so when we have a sudden need for glucose, the glycogen in the liver, uh, glycogen is made out of chains of glucose. So what, what the liver does and what the muscles do is they take these chains apart to give you glucose again, uh, give you glucose monosaccharides. Now. What I didn't tell you is that when you break down glucose, you release a lot of energy. It's an exothermic reaction. And it's actually quite a lot of, it's much more energy than the cell can use. And so what the cell does is the cell will convert the glucose into a smaller currency energy molecule called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, right? Adenosine triphosphate. So if you think of, if you were to think of energy as money, <clears throat> glucose is kind of like a $1,000 bill. If you have a $1,000 bill in your wallet, you have a lot of money, but it's not, it's probably not of any use to you in day-to-day -day affairs. You go, you go into the store and you say, I want a package of chewing gum and you, you, you hand the cashier a $100 bill. He'll say, I can't change that. I, so I can't give you any gum. You know, the gum is 25 cents. I don't have change for a $1,000 bill. Go away. Right, so you go to a bank and you have the bank exchange your $1,000 bill for a number of uh, a number of $5 bills. $5 bills are much more easily used in the types of everyday commerce that you that you're exposed to, right? So in fact, what the mitochondria actually do, they do not produce energy uh, contrary to what what it may have sounded like when I was talking earlier. They don't actually produce area, so uh, don't produce energy. Uh, they're, they're frequently said to be energy factories of the cell or powerhouses of the cell. You hear a lot of books and, and teachers using that expression, but that expression is a little bit inaccurate. In fact, what the mitochondria does is they do not produce energy. They simply convert glucose into ATP so the ATP is more easily used 
Right, so there's a long, complicated biochemical process called the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. This process, it's a series of chemical reactions that takes place inside mitochondria. And that process results in glucose being converted into ATP. So in fact, one, uh, one molecule of glucose is broken down into 34 molecules of ATP, and the, those ATP molecules can be used to, to power the smaller energy chemical reactions that take place inside a cell. Right? So in a way, a mitochondria is more like a bank than a factory, or it's more like a bank than, a, than an energy factory, because what you're doing is you're exchanging glucose, which is a large currency bill for ATP, which is a small currency bill, and then you can power your reactions in the cell with ATP. So in our diagram, these bean-shaped shapes are meant to be mitochondria. Mitochondria were once free-living, independent uh, archaebacteria bacteria that were at some point in evolution some of them were taken into eukaryotic cells and their ability to 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 uh, convert glucose into large amounts of ATP has been used by uh, the cells by eukaryotes ever since okay this is a better diagram of what a mitochondria looks like in three dimensions and then on the right we have a microscope image of a mitochondria as I said, the cytoskeleton is the skeleton that holds the cells into shape. It, it's actually, instead of made of bones, it's made of proteins. Uh, there are three types of bones. There are three types of protein bones that are used inside the cell. They're used to hold the, sh the cell into a certain shape, but also to help move things around inside the cell. Some of the uh, cytoskeletal filaments are used kind of like little conveyor belts to move ribosomes and, and, uh, and other things around inside the cell. There are basically three types of cytoskeletal filaments, right? A filament is like a kind of a tube structure, right? So we have microtubules. Microtubules, uh, microtubules are made of a protein called tubulin. So I could ask you that as a multiple choice question. They are the largest of the cytoskeletal filaments. Then we have, um, Sorry, I actually made a mistake on this slide. It, the, 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 large, the, the largest one should say uh, tubules, right? So then the micro, uh, sorry, microtubules is what it does say. I apologize. Okay, so the microtubules are the largest of the cytoskeletal filaments, and they're made of a, a specific protein called tubulin. So I could ask you what tubulin is and what it's for. The smallest um, cytoskeletal filaments are called microfilaments. They are made of another protein called actin, and they are the smallest. And then there's an intermediate size called intermediate filaments, which I will never ask you about. Okay, so I, at some point in the future, I could ask you, name two proteins that, that the cytoskeletal filaments are made of, and you can say tubulin and actin. I could say uh, between microtubules and microfilaments, which one is larger? Of course, the answer which one is larger is the microtubules, act, uh, the, and the, the actin microfilaments are much smaller. This is a very beautiful type of microscope image called a, called a fluorescence microscope, where you have the cell. The cell has been labeled with kind of fluorescent paints, specific that specifically bind to one protein versus another. So in this case, we've used a fluorescent paint, a, a blue fluorescent paint that will stick specifically to the nucleus, a green fluorescent paint. <coughs> excuse me, green fluorescent paint that sticks specifically to microtubules and a red fluorescent paint that sticks specifically to microfilaments. So you can see that a cell has an extensive, a very complicated extensive cytoskeletal skeleton. <clears throat> All right, as I said, the extracellular matrix is a network of filaments and carbohydrates and proteins inside which um, cells are attached. Three of the major proteins that you find inside the extracellular matrix are called elastin, collagen, and fibronectin. So you do need to know the names of these three proteins and that they are frequently constituents or components of the extracellular matrix. Right, so 
I could ask you to give me one example of a protein that you would find in the extracellular matrix, and so you could say elastin, collagen, or fibronectin, for instance. Now, the cells have proteins on their surfaces that allow them to attach to the proteins in the extracellular matrix, thus holding them in place, right? and those proteins are called integrins. Right? So the purpose of integrins, integrins are proteins that are embedded in the surface of the cell plasma membrane, and their function is to, to attach the cell to the elements of the extracellular matrix. Right, so here we have the extracellular matrix illustrated by these. These are meant to be proteins and carbohydrates, and the proteins are elastin, collagen, and fibronectin, as well as a few others. And here we see integrin proteins that are attached, embedded in the, in the plasma membrane surface of the cell, which are actually holding them in place within the extracellular matrix. If we're talking about animal cells, the, the major components we've just discussed, but if we're talking about plant cells, plant cells have at least two things that animal cells don't have. One of them is an organelle called a chloroplast. Chloroplasts are involved in photosynthesis. So you know that plants are green and the, that green pigment is, a, the green color is given to them by a bunch of pigments that are called the chlorophylls, which are green in color. And those green colored pigments are involved in converting sunlight into energy. And that energy in the form of ATP and other, other molecules, that energy is used to take carbon dioxide and convert carbon dioxide into either alpha or beta glucose. Right? So photosynthesis is where chloroplasts, chloroplasts are an organelle that convert sunlight into energy and then the energy is used to build starch or amylose or cellulose or any of those compounds. The other thing that a plant cell has that a human cell or an animal cell doesn't is a cell wall. So there's a rigid wall, an, uh, uh, you know, some sort of a polyhedral wall, polyhedron meaning it has bit corners on it, right? So, so cells, maybe some of them are octahedral, some of them are square, but there is usually a cell wall that is located outside the cell plasma membrane, and the cell wall that's located outside the plasma membrane is usually made of cellulose, which makes it quite rigid and strong. Okay, so here we see an animal cell on the left and a plant cell on the right. Notice that the plant cell has the, has the cell wall, which is outside the plasma membrane. Every year, uh, or you know, uh, very often, I ask on a qu on a quiz. I say, um, um, w does does a plant does a plant cell or an animal cell have a cell wall, or where would you find the cell wall in a plant cell, or something like that? And and inevitably, I, I trick the students into making the mistake of thinking that the cell wall is the cell plasma membrane, which it is not, right? So the, a cell wall is an entirely separate structure from the cell plasma membrane, and it is located outside the cell plasma membrane. Right? So you notice that one of the easiest ways to tell plant cells from, humans, from animal cells is that plant cells are polyhedral. In this case, the plant cell is a square, uh, but you can get plant cells that are octahedral or hectahedral or septahedral or something like that. They, they, they are just not circular, that's all. All right, so the, what are the sizes of some of these things? A typical animal cell is about 5 microns in diameter. A plant cell is usually much larger, 50 to 100 or so. A bacterium, like prokaryote, is much smaller, 1 micron typically. A mitochondrion is about 1 micron, the same size as a bacteria, and that is not a coincidence because the mitochondria originally came from bacteria. A ribosome is about 5 nanometers. A virus that infects a cell is typically 5 or 10 nanometers, which means that viruses are very, very small things. All right, so what do we need to, you know, so how small do things have to get before we can't see them without the aid of a microscope? Right, so anything this size, from the size of an adult human down to the size of about a frog egg, which is, a, if you've ever seen fro the eggs from frogs, you know that they are about a millimeter in size, which is quite enormous by cell standards, right? So you know that uh, most cells that constitute the body are about 10 microns, uh, as opposed to one, one millimeter, which is enormous compared to a regular cell. Okay, so any of these things we can see with the naked eye without a microscope. If we want to get smaller than that, we can use any of the cheap uh, 
light microscopes that we have in the biology lab for students. And then if we want to see things that are smaller than about 100 nanometers, we have to switch to a more expensive type of a microscope called an electron microscope. So let's discuss microscopes briefly. A bright field microscope is the technical name for a light microscope. So it, it's called a bright field microscope because if you look at a slide through, an, through a, a bright field microscope, the, 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 background, <clears throat> the background is very bright because essentially <clears throat> you're looking down into the light bulb, the light source of the microscope. Right, now there are two types of light microscopes. One of them is called a compound microscope, uh, which is the ones that we use in the lab. In a compound microscope, you have to slice the specimen that you're looking at. You have to slice it up into thin slices, and the light actually travels through the specimen. Right? So the light enters the slide and the specimen at the bottom and travels through the specimen into the eye of the observer. A dissection microscope, you're looking at surfaces of things, and you're actually looking down on the surface. Right? Now, there's another type of microscope that uses fluorescent light instead of regular visible light, which is what we saw that beautiful fluorescent picture with. That's, that was an example of a fluorescent microscope. Now, in order to see anything through the fluorescent microscope, you first have to stain the cells or whatever it is you're looking at with fluorescent dyes in order to make them fluoresce, in order to make them visible. All right, now that the resolution limit, this is a term you need to know. Resolution limit is the smallest distance that you can discern through a microscope, right? So let's say I had two cells that were close together. If the two cells, if I'm looking at those two cells through a light microscope, and if those two cells are farther apart than 0 0.1 microns, I can tell that they are not touching. If they were closer together than 0.1 microns, they would look to me, they would look like they were touching when they're not. So this ability to discern detail is referred to as the resolution limit of a microscope. Right? The resolution limit of a light microscope or a bright field microscope is about 0 0.1 microns or 100, 100 nanometers. Uh, for the typical cheap microscopes that we have in the biology lab, the resolution limit is probably something like 500 nanometers or 0.5 microns, something like that. If we go to more expensive microscopes that are more powerful, we have a smaller resolution limit where you can tell, you can discern distances of two or three nanometers. All right, now on the left, we have a, a compound microscope. It's called a compound microscope because it has many lenses. So the light source is here on the bottom. You cut up your specimen and put it onto a microscope slide, and then you put that slide onto the stage. This part here is called the stage in the microscope. Up here, we have two lenses that we look, look uh, through with our eyes, and so those are called the ocular lenses. The ocular lenses typically magnify the specimen you're looking at by a factor of about five times. Right, so you can actually pop one of these ocular lenses out. You can take it out and look through it like it was a, a, a monocle or something. You can just hold it up to your eye, and you can see that just the ocular lens alone will magnify things five times. And then these other things are this that are loaded on this turret are a bunch of lenses that are called the objective lenses, and they have different strengths, different powers. So typically there's a, a 3.5 times lens, and also a 10 times lens, and a 40 times lens, and a 100 times lens. And so you can rotate this nose piece to choose which of the objective lenses you want to use. So I said that I said that the ocular lenses, typically ocular lenses have a magnification power of either five or 10 times. Let's assume it's 10 this time. And if you swing into position the, uh, the, 100 times, the 100 times objective lens, then the image will be magnified, the image will be magnified according to the product of the ocular lens and the objective lens. When I say product, that means you multiply them together, right? So, the product of a 10 times ocular lens and a, and a 100 times objective lens is 1,000, isn't it? So 10 times 100 is 1,000. That means that the maximum magnification that you can get from a compound microscope is about 1,000 times. And that will give you a resolution limit of about 0 0.1 microns or about 100 uh, nanometers.
Right? So I could ask you that question on a quiz. Right? I could say, what is the approximate magnific what is the approximate resolution limit of a compound microscope? Uh, and then you can answer the the resolution limit I would be asking for. 100 nanometers or 0.1 microns for if I'm asking about magnification power then you would tell me a thousand times all right a dissecting microscope is where the light does not travel through the specimen you you simply put a dead bird down on this or a dead frog and then you literally dissect it and you look at it with these regular lenses there's a there's a pair of ocular lenses here too that are usually about 10 times magnification and then there's usually one lens down here that's a zoom lens that magnifies anywhere from 10 times to uh, 30 times or something like that but the magnification the magnification of a dissecting microscope is typically lower than that of a compound microscope. Now here's another thing you need to know, which is that when you look at specimens through a dissecting microscope, you are looking at a slice that goes through the specimen. When you're looking through a dissecting microscope, you are looking at the surface because the light doesn't go through it. Right? So you do, not, you do not slice up a specimen to look at it under the dissecting microscope. You only have to slice up, you only have to cut your specimen into thin slices if you're going to look at it under the, under the compound microscope. All right, fluorescence microscopes. Uh, I won't actually explain fluorescence microscopes. Basically, you use something that looks like a compound microscope, except it illuminates. Instead of using visible light to illuminate the specimen, in, to light up the specimen, we use a fluorescent light. And in order to see anything, we have to stain the, the specimen with a fluorescent dye. Now, electron microscopes are much more powerful. There are two types of electron microscopes. One is called a transmission electron microscope, and this is where you slice the uh, you slice the specimen up into a thin slice. And there's another type called a scanning electron microscope, where you look at the surface. Right. So in that sense, a transmission electron microscope, abbreviated TEM, is kind of analogous. It's kind of similar to a compound microscope, and the scanning electron microscope abbreviated SEM, is kind of analogous, it's kind of similar to a dissecting microscope, only much more powerful. And the resolution limit for a transmission or a scanning electron microscope is typically about one nanometer. This is an electron microscope. You can see it's much more, it's much bigger, it's much more expensive. It, it uses high voltage electricity and a, a something called an electron gun. Uh, and it has to be, the, the specimen has to be loaded into the microscope and then all the air has to be evacuated out of the space with a vacuum pump. And so it's a very expensive piece of machinery that uses high voltage. If you break it, uh, it will be very expensive to replace it. These things cost about $200,000. Uh, and brand new that is and so as a result of that the laboratories that have electron microscopes generally don't want anybody who doesn't know how to use it to even touch it because the electricity could electrocute you if you don't know what you're doing and also it's very expensive so if you break it it would be very expensive to replace it or to repair it all right so the image at the top here was taken by a transmission electron microscope, you can see this is a slice through the cell where you're able to see the nucleus. The type of image that you see in popular magazines, you know, when you see the head of a spider or the head of a flea or something like that, is taken by a scanning electron microscope, which is down here below. Now, don't get the impression that because you're always looking at insects and things with scanning electron microscopes, that scanning electron microscopes do not have as great a magnification power as a, as a TEM does, because they do. And so, Occasionally, we use uh, we do use uh, scanning electron microscopes to look at the surfaces of cells, and that's that's why we figured out that cells. One of the ways that we figured out that cells have receptors and things like that on their surfaces by using the scanning electron microscope. All right, so we talked about all the different types. We talked about the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, animal cells and plant cells. We talked about different types of microscopes, bright field, compound, TEM, SEM. We talked about the major organs inside cells, the plasma membrane and the fact that it's selectively permeable, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the difference between the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, mitochondria, ribos ribosomes, and the cytoskeleton and the cytoskeleton little filaments.
Okay, so remember that the plasma membrane is, is a very specialized uh, part of the cell and it is responsible for osmosis due to the selective permeability and also for the three forms of endocytosis that we, that we discussed, phagocytosis, uh, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. All right, so that's, that's it for talking about cell biology. If you found that discussion interesting, if you, if you found this discussion interesting, you might want to register for Biology 200 next time around because you spend the whole semester talking about cells and it is a fascinating subject. Uh, but I will see you at the next lecture where we talk about how we describe the shapes and forms and dimensions and directions of the human body. Okay, thank you very much.